Hi, everybody. Welcome to this edition of the Amigos Interview. My special guest today, you've, had, you've heard him before on the Amigos Interview, but today we're going to be taking a look at his musical endeavors. We're here with Ravi Abbott. Hey, Ravi. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Doing just fine. Glad to have you on. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about not Ravi Abbott, award-winning podcaster, uh, show host, uh, museum curator to the stars. I want to talk about Ravi Abbott, DJ. Okay, so yeah, um, sure. so I guess before we talk about you know your work with the Amiga, which I think we'll we'll kind of close out with, I want to go back to sort of your early influences with music. You know, how did you get into the whole kind of dance DJ house scene? Yeah, it's it's kind of mad because we had a uh, synth synth music in Britain it was really big. So like kind of synthesizer based stuff and um, an area that a lot of that stuff came from was like Sheffield, uh, a lot of the kind of northern towns and working class towns as well. And that was very big, like when I was a bit younger, but that it, it crossed over. So, you know, like guys like Gary Newman yeah. and and stuff like that. But also there was a few artists. So there was one called John Fox, who um, he was... Uh, basically Ultravox's kind of lead before they did the Oh Vienna, mm-hmm. you know, that, that yeah, 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 yeah. So he left, but he did some Amiga tunes as well. So he did Speedball 2. Oh, really? Um, wow. Yeah, he did Gods as well. So he had that kind of synth stuff, but going into dance. And uh, a lot of the dance influence that we had was stuff like the Happy Mondays, which were uh, a kind of indie group. Mm-hmm. but they do stuff with a dance beat so there's a lot of crossover from different areas like uh the the, the reggae scene um kind of went into jungle music which was uh, like another form of faster dance and then that got a bit more sophisticated and went into drum and bass so when i was younger i was listening to a lot of pirate radio mm-hmm. um it was a new sound that had just come out in the uk which was from the kind of reminiscence of the rave scene. So we had this thing called the Peace Convoy that happened, um, which is crazy. You probably didn't have this in any other country, but in the 80s, a lot of people um, just got disassociated. They had no work. They uh, had nothing to do, really, a lot of the young people. So they just bought these huge trucks. Okay. And then ran in a big convoy around the country, raving everywhere. Wow. (laughs) and that that was like the the summer of 85 86 and I I was just being born then but what we got was they had these huge raves then they introduced these laws to stop these raves and uh they had to have some like uh, the law was ridiculous it was like you can't gather more than 12 people in a field and listen to a repetitive beat of more <laughs> than this BP It was very specific <laughs> Yeah, and then they were like, oh, no, it's not designed to destroy dance music at all. <laughs> um, but what happened when I was younger was uh, this this had been killed off, this big kind of ray thing, but there was uh, all these people in the convoy. So it was a huge convoy, like probably 200 vehicles at one point. So lots of families in there, lots of people. They all returned back after coming from the raves, and they really couldn't integrate in society and stuff. They were like... Um, squatting and you know uh, uh and they started a scene called free parties which was basically a warehouse that would be opened up and they'd have a party inside it and everybody would come and they'd try and keep it from the police so instead moved it from the fields to the kind of warehouses and when i was about 13 14 we used to go around to these and they'd be amazing like some of them they'd have uh that have like ska bands in there. So, you know, like ska music. <laughs> so it you really know? wasn't limited to EDM. It was just like anybody that wants to be part Anything, of the scene. Yeah, so, so one night you'd have a reggae night. Another one you'd have ska with saxophones, a full band with all the horns and drum kit, mm-hmm. <laughs> like projection screens. Uh, it was mad and these would go on for years. So like we had one called Pelham Avenue and every different um, time, like, they be left alone as well because it would be on an industrial estate the police wouldn't really care unless it was like new year's or something where they had to seem like they were um, (laughs) right uh, right you know coming in and uh this uk garage scene came out which was the kind of last reminiscence of the the rave stuff in the uk 
and uh, it was basically the US House Records. Um, they used to play them on a Sunday in a club after uh, Ministry of Sound, and it would be like this kind of. It, it's hard to describe. It's a, a kind of jaggy, a bouncy, skippy, skippy kind of drum beats because they get the US House speed it up. And it was that British kind of skippiness, mm -hmm. bounciness that everybody was into. Uh, it was definitely more it, of an up-tempo thing, right? Yeah, yeah. But it was also like we used to call it two-step because it was a different kind of step and then four by four as well, which was another kind of uh, a style. And I really got into that. And then I'd DJ on the pirate radio with my mates. <laughs> so we'd get on there and it was just when text messaging came out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you'd get a text from another give them the shout on the air and it was really exciting oh and yeah so tell you'd have a track that blew up and all the phones would go <laughs> like when when the bass line dropped tell me about your rig on the pirate radio what did, what did you have set up equipment wise well i i was really into the technology mm -hmm. but um what we'd have was there was a standard turntable which was the technics 1210 mm -hmm. and uh everybody would use that that was like the industry standard right. of turntable right and they still kind of retain their value as well, which is great. But um, the pirate radios were pretty complex in the UK. So they had a, a thing called a, <laughs> it was all built off kind of stolen technology. So they, they <laughs> It should stole, be, it's pirate, uh, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they stole um, from the top of temporary traffic lights. You know, when you have a builder's uh, roadside site, mm -hmm. uh, they take the, the radar horn off the top of there and you could change it so it uh, it went to 10 gigahertz. So you could basically have a, like a remote, just visual link to the actual um, transmitter from your studio. Okay. Uh, with, using a microwave signal, which was basically using this uh, kind of dodgy horn yeah. that they'd retuned. Yeah. And then they'd have like VHS players and uh, audio would go into the VHS player and it would do some kind of equalization just you know, a cheap video player would kind of equalize the signal a little bit, and then you'd have the output coming out. Mm -hmm. So they'd be adapting loads of <laughs> mad pieces of technology to kind of uh, use on these pirates. And then uh, stuff like, it got crazy later on, so I got really into the technology. I, I witnessed some of this as well, but um, there was a, a traffic report that you would get on your radio. So you'd be driving through an area and it switches suddenly. Um, to, you know, oh, this is a traffic update, and then it'll switch back to your normal station. Well, the idea was hijacking those, so people would drive into a certain area of London or in Nottingham, and suddenly their station would switch to the pirate, even though they didn't touch anything. Oh, wow. On well, yeah, so it, it got really advanced later I'm, on. I'm sure then, the uh, the traditional stations were thrilled about that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So then I'll, that's what I'll I sit you. what I'd like to see is you know in one of these computer history museums or these technology museums I'd love to see just a room dedicated to private radio that has that whole setup that you just described with like the VHS player and stuff like that that's super <laughs> yeah. cool and it's kind of like they had the 60s pirates that were out at the sea mm -hmm. and then like the 80s pirates went into the tower blocks and the 90s ones kind of went into that and they're still very prominent so if you go into London you'll still pick up a lot of pirate radios really? there's a lot lot of people listening to fm in the uk still because uh we did our digital radio system too early mm. and we got a low standard oh so, okay um so we adopted really early thinking we were cool and then <laughs> like we have low bit rate and no one listens to it mm. you know? mm. so there's no really is there a like a serious xm sort of service in england uh what do you mean okay XM? so uh in in america we have satellite radio and it's popular with like long haul truck drivers and really a lot of people, whenever you buy a car, it always comes with a trial of XM radio. And okay. it's basically, it's higher quality uh, than FM radio, but it's still lower quality than like a, like, I think it's like 96 KPVS. I mean, it's, it's, it's not stellar sound quality, but it's all commercial free and it's a subscription based thing. You don't have any comparable yeah. service in the UK? Well, we have, DAB, which is the digital. So that's what you were just system. describing, okay? Yeah, but the problem with that is, you know, it's meant to be higher quality, but they shoved so many stations on it, they ended up reducing all the quality of everyone oh, okay. to make profit. So we've even got some 32 kilobit 
stations wow. on there. <laughs> it's like worse than a phone call. <laughs> pointless. Yeah. yeah, completely pointless. But they, they tried to fill it out. And also, if you buy a car, you have to pay extra to have that in, which is, you know, people just don't want to pay they're, extra. They're not going to go for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, you were you were involved in the in the pirate radio scene, and then did you use that as a jumping off point when you started, you know, playing your first shows? Well, I was kind of like we we produced like at the time there was a trend um, to do remixes of kind of really cheesy stuff. So we had a, a medical show called Casualty, and they'd remix the sirens coming in <laughs> and the theme song of that. Okay. So, we did like a Ghostbusters remix. Really? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. And we um, went to the shop because every pirate radio would kind of have a record shop as well. Mm-hmm. So they'd play the cooler records and then they'd go come to the shop and buy this. And it would kind of like help fund it as well. And uh, we went there and we're like, can you play my CD? <laughs> and then he played it on air. And that was that was probably like the high point of my career. But then later on i just got dj decks for myself and uh i'd I'd do a few things on that but the garage scene also really died off as well which wasn't good because uh it got very violent basically Mm. um so explain can you remind me like what were the hallmarks of the garage scene so the garage scene originally started um really sexy so the idea of it was people would turn up in like uh really expensive Averex jackets or like you know um, really nice kind of Valentino stuff or really high end clothes they'd also drink Dom Perignon oh, that was the okay. fa- famous drink of it and uh, that was the idea they'd originally do that the, the, the gigs would be on a Sunday so it would be after clubbing you'd go to a garage club dress sexy lots of sexy girls mm. and drink champagne and it was very soulful funky uh, then later on, we got like the kind of gangster rap guys that came in, mm. and it's very different. UK, um, you know, you hear the MCs rhyming and stuff. It's very different because the culture of rapping comes from um, the Jamaican side of stuff. So, mm-hmm. uh, like the, the the MCs and the toasters in Jamaica that would do this big diss against each other, or it'd be really aggressive lyrics. But it wasn't like the Eminem kind of freestyle stuff it was it was it, it was, was very more diff- it was more structured right i mean in terms of like the rhyming it was it was more of a, a rhythm you know, like a repeated yeah, rhythm sort of but, thing but, but also it is more cheesy okay okay so, uh, <laughs> i was trying to be diplomatic because, about it you know <laughs> yeah well we'd have a lot like um fairgrounds so you'd go to fairgrounds <clears throat> mm-hmm. and they'd be playing a lot of the rave music and the guy in the fairground would sound like the guy on the radio he'd be <laughs> like uh uh, keep your hands inside the car at all times <laughs> and uh, you know collect your tokens at the booth <laughs> and he'd also be playing the same kind with of the music. same backing track yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so it's all kind of mixed in with that but then um we had a bit of uh, asian influence as well so it's always about these different communities coming together because that was the best thing about garage it was like black and white united mm-hmm. straight away and we had the Asian thing, but the Asians, they called themselves Apache, like Apache Indian. Okay. So it was a play on the kind of word Indian. And we had a guy, UK Apache, and they all, they'd all they always have a gravelly voice. And when we were little kids, we'd have, you know, cassette tapes that would be sharing of these crazy MCs mm. and uh, <laughs> people like that. Yeah. So was the, um, when, you know, was this sort of thing available through normal retail channels at all, or was it an entirely an underground movement? No, no, it was. It started underground, so you'd listen to a lot of like we had a station called Heatwave Radio, and that lasted twelve years in Nottingham, mm-hmm. um, constant transmission because it was in an area that the police wouldn't go into because if they did, they'd spark off a huge riot. Oh my so gosh! It was basically they did advertise where they were. They were at a bakery. And they'd be like, yeah, come to the bakery. You know, it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't a secret or anything like that. But um, you'd listen to them more than the commercial stations because at that time, Radio 1 had... They always have a problem, Radio 1, where they kind of get these young DJs on and get the young audience, and then the DJs get older and older and older, and they keep them on. So they slowly get out of touch with the youth until a new sound comes in, and then they get a new set of right. young DJs. So it's the like BBC the cyclical all, thing, yeah. 
Yeah, they were always playing catch up. Mm. And uh, so we were all listening to the pirates then, but also cassette tapes, you know, mixtapes. That was a big thing. Oh, yeah. The people taking around mixtapes and uh, like even to the point, actually, um, they wouldn't release CD packs of them. A lot of the live raves they'd have in these things called tape packs and you'd get like six cassettes and it would. And this was even like, you know, into the 2000s. Mm-hmm you'd still be getting cassette recordings. Now, is this a source yeah. of income for these DJs? I mean, in terms of like, you know, they'd go play oh, a yeah, show yeah, and yeah. they'd say, you know, if you like this here, buy my stuff. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, they were massive events. They were like, the UK clubbing scene was huge then. So we had these things called super clubs. Mm-hmm. So basically they'd taken these, you know, 30,000 people in the field and then they got 20,000 or, or 10,000 in a club you know and it would be a huge massive organized warehouse and we had some mad ones like uh, gate crasher was one a uh, slamming vinyl as well they used to have two sets of bouncers so they'd have the bouncers for the outside who had dogs and big sticks <laughs> and they had the guys inside and if there was a fight that got really bad all the guys on the outside would go in. rush in <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah and that's why it why it got very aggressive and violent later on like i had lots of friends that were you know really nice guys that would be playing in the city center and someone would get bottled or glassed or something what do you event and what do you think that, just no need for that yeah what do you think the catalyst was for for the vi- for the violence i mean if it didn't start out that way what what made it move in that direction gills leaving the scene really <laughs> so it was, it, yeah uh, too many boys yeah. in, in one place. Yeah. It always causes drama. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense. And also, it, it turned very gangster because there was a different... Each region of England had their own sound. So, UK... Uh, Nottingham was kind of bouncy, two-steppy. Um, Birmingham was, like, all about the bass line. They concentrated on that. As you went higher north, it got harder, mm. the sound did. Uh, and then London, it was this very aggressive gang kind of um what what people call grime now okay that, that kind of came from london but uh the few midlands people weren't really into that they were more into the bouncy jumpy kind of raver mm-hmm. raver music rather than the uh stuff uh and then you got gang like so solid crew were one of the big gangs and it all started to turn a bit gangster rappy mm. you know? do you think that there was you know as more and more there was more and more influence you know as influence started to shift away from you know the caribbean to make places like this and more towards you know america la you know stuff like yeah, that yeah is... i think it turned into the it was that rap battle culture that came over rather than the old MCs going you know come inside the car <laughs> <laughs> it was like you know it changed to like uh, insults about mothers and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and that just creates more hype. Yeah, and, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how much? But then Dizzy Rascal came out of that, so you know. <laughs> how how much did uh, was drug culture a factor in those early days? Oh, it, massively, one hundred percent. There wouldn't have been the cultural shift or the change at all. Um, not in in the period that I was in, um, ecstasy was quite popular still, but. Um, from my brother's period, that was essential. Like the main, um, yeah, this this will surprise you, John. The main people that started the first big raves in London when ecstasy came out were Millwall, uh, Chelsea, and you know these football firms that in the seventies were beating the hell out of each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they all said, "Let's have a party in a warehouse," and they were all hugging each other. You know, it was a <laughs> Total, total cultural shift. There's stories about guys like, um, you know, they never experienced that kind of, the early clubs, you'd go in there and there'd be all different walks of life, like um, builders, uh, accountants, uh, everybody just letting off steam. Mm -hmm. And people would just quit their jobs. That's why that peace convoy happened. Um, Yeah, this one, I remember Sean Ryder saying, you know, builders were writing poetry and handing it to him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what's going on and that's how that peace convoy started because these people kind of took a, a lot of drugs and then felt they wouldn't fit in society anymore it's all, almost of... a replay of sort of what happened here in the 60s in the united states yeah people dropping yeah. Well, out we, we and called yeah. it we called it the summer of love mm-hmm. that was the um actual name of it yeah 85 was the summer of love so wow. uh that was massive change of culture but also as that went on with the super clubs mm-hmm. it was uh into the 90s with trance and stuff that that was that was an amazing thing as well because uh you know you know um i think it was 
Lazy Jones, which was a game for Commodore 64. That was Craft um, Can 4000, which turned into a tune called Zombie Nation, which was absolutely huge. But it was still the C64 song. Mm-hmm. So you'd walk down the road and there'd be gangs of six lads, big lads, singing a C64 tune. <laughs> it was so, so surreal. Very surreal. Did you, yeah. did most people that were into this sort of music, I mean, were you out going to record stores buying like the nine inch extended mix or were you just listening to cassettes? We were buying all the vinyl. Yeah. So we'd buy white labels as well. So a lot of the times the white labels would be, um, kind of promotion pressing so you you'd maybe have a phone number on there and mm-hmm. nothing else and uh a lot of the time that was to avoid copyright but also you know these people weren't signed on labels yet and um sometimes people would master it on cassette so you know they'd done the whole thing they'd master it on cassette then they'd transfer that to a dat tape to try and make it look a bit more professional <laughs> when they went to the record company that's but, so funny uh, it's so funny it, even to the point we had some that were um, recorded off pirate radio so people would literally record the MC off the pirate radio go that was a good track and then dub play it onto vinyl and then sell that over the country so you might get a bit of FM static in there wow <laughs> that's unbelievable it, it yeah. reminds me of all of these you know anal- or these these digital recordings these days that are now being pressed onto uh, you know pressed onto records and marketed as analog recordings but there's never been an analog recording anywhere in the chain except when they yeah. cut it onto the record you know that's it yeah totally and uh, it was like it had that homemade feel you know kind of made in people's bedrooms and it was a very British sound as well which was good yeah yeah so I mean, obviously, these white label records, you're not going to go to the, uh, you know, the Virgin Megastore or the Tower or something to buy these. Are these like, (laughs) where are you going to buy these sorts of records? You'd have all these like independent specialist dance music record shops. Okay. So they're not around so much now. You have like, but there are lots of record shops in the UK, but they're selling like reprints of uh, expensive stuff. And, you know, there's a few dance ones, but they were mainly just dance. And I remember I used to save up all my money. I'd have a bit for a few Amiga magazines. Then I'd go in and I'd I'd buy like I'd put a stack like that of vinyl. Go, what are the latest things? And then just sit there listening through them in the shop, and then buy about three or four because they were they were seven pounds each. Oh, okay. Well, so, so I mean, seven that's, or thirteen. That's not. But then if you were Dan Wood, you got them for free. So. <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah. he was already connected even at that early stage. Yeah, if you were a big name, you got sent stuff through the post. So I mean, how did that? How did that? I was, you know, seven pounds, that seems really expensive for what amounts to a single. Because, um, yeah. you know, a full record was not going to cost you too much more than that, was it? Yeah, well, literally, most of my, 90% of my money would go yeah, onto it. I, I probably, mean, that's a, that's a large know, amount. 30 pounds a week or something, mm-hmm. and that, I was like 18, 19. Yeah, so working, and then all your money goes to vinyl. Yeah. But I've still got them all. Do you? <laughs> you know? I was, that was my next yeah, question, yeah. is if you held on to them all. What's the yeah, yeah. Uh, what's the secondary market look for look like for those these days? I mean, is there a, amazing? Is it really? Well, because yeah, yeah, I've got this like really bad Slim Shady remix, and uh, yeah, that's about fifty quid. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> because they're all like co- breaking copyright. They're all like limited numbers of uh, produced vinyl as well. You know. Did they actually number them as they put them out too, like one of 50 or something like that? Yeah, or you'd have little scratchings in the actual... Yeah, in the um, records, like bootleg yeah, records, yeah. yeah. But then um, a thing called Serato came out later on, which kind of killed that off, and CDJs as well. So, like, um, CDJs were basically being able to DJ with CDs and put MP3s on there. But then Serato is crazy. It's a, It's like a vinyl disc that has a digital time code on it and then you can get your laptop and actually somehow don't know how transpose the uh, digital signal so onto if you've got the vinyl. if you've got like an eight second loop at two minutes and 30 seconds in you just key that in and then it'll cue it up immediately or, or even the whole tune you just select the mp3 drop it and then that vinyl will act like it'll act like um, the whole record yeah and you can rewind oh, it man. And scratch it yeah and that changed everything when that happened everybody dropped carrying around cases, cases of yeah. records but there's still a lot of people that like to because uh i used to be a sound engineer and this one guy uh he came to a gig and he's like i've got my whole collection of music on one usb 
And then he had a few drinks and he's like, I've lost the USB. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what are you going to do, mate? <laughs> you know, a big bag of vinyl. You're you know, not going to misplace that. So, um, <laughs> you know, in terms of, you know, as, as you've, you've sort of grown up in this scene and you've seen the rise and fall of all these formats, was there a time period where, you know, the sound quality was just awful because everybody was using 96K MP3s, you know, and doing their mixes from those instead of the, the original recordings and stuff? Yeah, to a degree there was. Like, um, people kind of forget how good Minidisc was. Oh, yeah. And uh, Minidisc for live recording was, like, amazing. So there'd be a lot of Minidisc going around, a lot of live bands, and people would master to that as well. But then um, there was this kind of crossover point. Mm -hmm. um, they had a thing called NetMD, which was uh, with Sony. And that was kind of like you put your MP3s onto mini disc and like compress them down. And it's when the compression came in, that was uh, when it sounded rubbish. Because, you know, vinyl, a lot of vinyl now, um, all those old MP3s can't be used. You have to, you have, to have them at 320 kilobits mm -hmm. um, because if you're playing on like a huge valve Jamaican sound system or something, it's not going to work um, playing a low quality MP3. It's just going to come out as a big, brrr, yeah. you know, but if you have the vinyl, you're actually getting the needle going on it and it's uh, it's that much higher quality. And now you can buy packs of every single one of those white labels that's been ripped into 320 mm. uh, kilobit MP3. So I've got one at the moment and it's like 17 gig. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess they have to be that big because those. Are the, I mean, you're talking about massive files, you know. Yeah, yeah. Point. And then a lot of those stuff that we were downloading from Napster is just completely, completely useless because mm -hmm. it was so low in quality. You know? Yeah, yeah. So tell me about your the, the the first show you were ever a DJ for. Oh God, I don't I don't know if I can remember. I used to do a lot of parties. Mm -hmm. like What's the first one you can parties. remember? I remember just this one mad party where um, we, we basically, my mate had built a, a pirate radio transmitter and he'd built half of it with a drain pipe. That was like the aerial was a drain pipe with wire stretched down it. And um, he bought it in a shopping trolley. So this is, this is just, we were pushing around a really posh area, just this huge transmitter in a shopping trolley, not caring. Mm. And then uh, it was at a friend's garage, and we put it on the roof of his, and we were all DJing and rapping downstairs. It was quite a good fun, yeah. And then um, my big gig, I don't know, I think since I started doing the Amiga stuff, that's when I've really, really kind of kicked off with my um, DJing, because before, it was quite hard with vinyl, because you get a little bit of flutter. Mm -hmm. They call it wow and flutter, and you get stuff like it's slowing down, it's speeding up. You it's know, not constant, not yeah. It's not constant, mm. yeah. With the Amiga stuff, it's digital, yeah. so it's like completely constant. And I found it much easier. And also, I've always wanted to kind of play with mods mm -hmm. and edit them. So I did a gig um, supporting DJ Yoda at Nottingham Contemporary, and that was, uh, you know, 200 people, and it was on a huge sound system. Mm -hmm. And that's really scary. I'm oh, like, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, yeah. I prefer to play online now because in real life, it's kind of scary. I, I don't like to look at the audience. You just pretend <laughs> I'm in my bedroom. <laughs> you know? What are the, you know, what are the considerations whenever when you're DJing with Amigas that you think about? That I mean, obviously, like you said, you don't have to worry about the the wow and flutter like you do on a turntable. But what are some of the other things that can possibly go wrong? Because Part of my brain tells me, well, he's he's got two computers up there, and he's just, you know, he's queuing up one song, and he's queuing up another one. But, you know, what are the things, what are the pitfalls that you can fall into whenever you're doing that sort of DJing? So there's a new thing that's come out in audio, and I actually think this is an advantage that the Amigas have, but um, is multi-band processing. Mm -hmm. So um, before, when you make a track, you'd aim for, like, the drums to be like maybe a bit quieter and then have some high keyboard or, or something like that you know you'd have a balance of uh volume would actually kind of define how the track's done whereas now it's all put on the same level to sound good in a car to sound good in your shower on your crap tinny phone you know so there's not that kind of um, there's not a dynamic uh such a dynamic yeah, range there's not that yeah dynamic range and now you hear people play it and 
they'll play out of some CDJs or that Serato or something, and it will just come out compressed. Mm-hmm. And it, you you don't get the same kind of really high highs. And oh yeah, when you look at the when you look at the waveform, yeah. it just looks like a block. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and that's what happens with the Amiga. So it comes out um, uncompressed, mm-hmm. uh, but PCM, which was like a '90s audio standard, and uh, when it's on a big sound system, people probably haven't heard that uncompressed kind of sound since the '90s, mm-hmm. and it takes them back. And oh yeah, that's really good. Right. But then also, a lot of the mods are homemade as well, so people have sampled them. They've got squealing on them. Mm-hmm. They're like not the highest quality or they've been sampled off a cassette and then you play that on a 10k sound system Mm -hmm. and it amplifies that all uh, of that distortion and everything noise yeah (laughs) Yeah, do you ever have to cut like use like a high pass filter or something just to kind of cut down on those high frequencies yeah sometimes oh we tend to put a noise gate yeah so so like drums when they get too loud Mm -hmm. you just have a not a a limiter limiter it basically limits it, yeah, but no compression, but just a limiter on the top, probably, because you know Amiga mods, they're all at a different volume, and I'm also adjusting on the fly on the mixer right. to try to kind of get an idea of what it's like. It's hard in a space when it's so big, though. It's interesting. I mean, was there ever an attempt, you know, in the scene back in the day to sort of standardize sort of the levels, you know, that you, it just, it's sort of a white paper that says, listen, if you're going to make a mod, you need to make sure that it fits in between here and here. It can't go over, it can't peak over minus 3 dB or something like that. Yeah, I wish there was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there is. And it's the same with Garage as well. There was no kind of standard with that and a lot of the house because it was from bedroom producers right. to, you know, guys, guys using massive... Rigs and, and I'm stuff. sure most of these people, you know, as they were creating, they would never think in a million years that in 20 years somebody'd be playing this through, you know, like you said, one of these huge sound systems. That... Yeah, yeah, you know, even back then they probably thought they were just playing about, but um, there were quite a few rave rave bands that did do Amiga tunes just with Amigas, but then they also mastered on top of that. Mm-hmm. So we had Calvin Harris, who's a really big guy. Recently he did his album uh, using Amiga as well, which was crazy but obviously he'd done Amiga to set up the drums and the basics and then he'd got some pro tools in and some yeah I mean that's what I, you stuff, know another you know? another thing I was wondering about is if for, this is a, this is going to elicit a different response from everybody but at what point for you does it no longer become Amiga you know because you can take a mod and you can stick it into pro tools and you can do whatever you want with it you know so yeah what i i don't know i just i just like the sound of it mm-hmm. you know but i'd happily use xm.xm i thought that was a cool format um when fast tracker came out and the pc stuff but i'd need two 486s <laughs> <laughs> to dj with that but um yeah I, i'd happily do atari stuff as well i'm looking at stj because mm-hmm. uh, that uses the other chip and it sounds quite nice and Spectrums as well have this really jaggy. Oh yeah. Of, yeah, that AY chip. That. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, have yeah. you have you looked into the you know the C sixty four probably the most famous sound chip in history? Uh, have you looked into you know SID tunes and things like that? Yeah, yeah. I've got a C sixty four back here that I'm trying to get running with SID player at the moment. But I think um, with retro stuff, it tends to be like people are now using the options of stuff that's already been set up. So like you notice there's a lot of Game Boy DJs out there. Mm-hmm. It's because there's been this software that's been developed for a long time called LSDJ. So you can buy it, you can get tunes, there's tutorials on it and all stuff. But like STJ, STDJ, mm-hmm. there's not that many users of, but then that has other functions the Amiga stuff doesn't. So oh, really? it's going into MIDI. Yeah, so you can like synchronize your MIDI tunes with the Atari and then do some kind of synced or automated mixing as well. Oh wow! I think. So you just, yeah. there's there's nothing even if you have sort of a MIDI interface with the Amiga that's it, it's still really difficult to do that. Yeah, unless there was some software developed. Mm-hmm. So it's, the, it's you know the interest in the in in making music on the system like the Vectrex, they couldn't do that for a long time until I think Citrix was actually like, oh look, I've made it 
make music. And now suddenly there's demos with music coming I want to talk to you. I'm glad you brought that up because I want to talk to you about your um, – one thing that Aaron and I always comment on whenever we watch your videos is that you've got that Vectrix poster, you know, in your room right behind you. Yeah. Um, and tell me about that. Uh, you know, how did you get involved with the Vectrix? Because I didn't think that had any kind of UK penetration at all. Well, I, I didn't see many mm -hmm. back in the days, actually, because it's Milton Bradley, right. wasn't it? Um, uh, yeah, I didn't see many back in the days until I started going to retro shows. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my God, what is this machine? And it was really awesome. Like, uh, problem is, I, I want to get one, but like, I've, I've seen shelves of 30 fried ones. You know, yeah. people go through them mm -hmm. like those but i think it's that crt kind of obsession i, I just love the idea of oh and you know uh, you know aaron has one and uh and he's afraid to use it a lot of the time just because he doesn't want to he doesn't yeah. want to kill it but it's an amazing you know there's something about a vector monitor when you're seeing those beams on the screen and they just come alive that phosphor glow that's it yeah you can't emulate that either on you know a traditional crt or lcd it's an entirely different sort of thing so uh boy i'd i'd love for somebody you know for some kickstarter to come out where they'd say hey we're going to be able to make these crts so we can replace all the broken ones that are out there it'd be cool if you could uh, do it with the light pan as well oh yeah you could make, make music with that that would yeah. be super <laughs> super be... fun so yeah. um, as we as we come to an end, I, I want to ask you about your your upcoming plans. You know, as as a DJ, um, are are there some upcoming shows that that you'd like to plug? Yeah, well, I, I've been doing a couple of shows uh, this year, and I did a big one in Sheffield last year. Um, but it's weird because I kind of like doing the stuff online, mm -hmm. and uh, I like performing live. But as you know, with music, you've got to like dedicate yourself yeah. to it haven't you yeah absolutely and i've got so many other things going on so one thing i've done is i've realized i've done 30 mixers now of different styles so i think that's a lot of quality mm -hmm. uh, no a lot of quantity and now i want to kind of do quality so what i'm going to do is i'm looking at making a mix album i'm maybe thinking of now that's what i call amiga but i don't um i think that might have been done before but uh I'll think up a, a cool name, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in on uh, doing a mix and do it about 10, 20 times until I get it really perfectly and then cut that into order and have like a nice, nice, you know, hour or two mix. Oh, yeah. Really, really done to perfection. That's what I'd like to do. But then, you know, it's hard to distribute stuff um, because of copyright and stuff. So I'd give that out to everybody for free. Mm -hmm. But you can but then another, you can then take that on the road with you though, and that can be your that can be your main mix that you play at shows. Yeah, and another thing I want to do is because like with the retro hour, we're doing like seven events a year at the moment, so that's one every two months. It's insane. You know? It's insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to alternate it, so I wanted to do this year an event, then a music festival, then an event, and a music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I thought I'd kill myself, so maybe next year I'm going to try and apply for some because um, that is one of the biggest things we have in the UK at the moment. Um, the kind of clubbing scenes died a lot, but uh, music festivals are huge. There's about 80 or 90 in the country mm -hmm. and they're all going on at different times. So like, you know, even if I, if I apply, I think maybe I've got enough quirkiness for, for organizers to be like, Oh, that's something different. Oh yeah. And maybe, Maybe I'll get a, a, a tent at some strange event. Or no something way! Like that. Your your main and that could be fun. your your main yeah. your main stage Glastonbury first year. They're just gonna put you right on there. <laughs> I, I want to. I'll be in like the the comedy field or the kids field or something. First, <laughs> the comedy it? field. field Is there yeah. anything worse than the comedy field? Come on. <laughs> so you've you've had a chance to interview some of the biggest names in in retro gaming history through through the retro hour. Um, if you had uh, your own interview show where you interviewed musicians, who would be your ultimate uh, choice for a musician to interview? Oh, God, yeah. Uh, maybe Brian Eno. Mm -hmm. I think he, he's amazing. Um, any of the Beatles, uh, Madness, um, the kind of British piano band sucks, mm -hmm. um, those guys. Uh, yeah, not that many modern people, actually. <laughs> Probably a lot of older dudes but that was one thing that me and dan really wanted to do we wanted to do our own um 
kind of UK garage show where we'd interview some of the old MCs and DJs and stuff like that, but we haven't got the time. Really. Yeah, yeah. What about, you know, what about somebody, of course, who wouldn't want to interview Paul McCartney or Brian Eno, but what about somebody oh, yeah. actually in the garage scene? Is there somebody that's as respected as McCartney within that scene that you'd like to talk to? <laughs> well, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a guy called MC Creed. Oh, MC and, Creed, uh, okay. He was, he was the first... MC, he was the first kind of garage MC that I, I saw him on top of the pops, mm -hmm. and uh, he. I'll try and do an impression of him now. <laughs> His voice is kind of very low, and um, he basically drank lots of whiskey and smoked cigars, and then his voice has gone to a very low. So, sort of like the, sounds... the British Tom Waits. Yeah, <laughs> and it sounds awesome over a track. So I'd, I'd love to talk to him yeah oh, cool cool well ravi thank you so much for taking taking some time out of your day to talk talk about music and stuff i you know i've, I've wanted to do this for a long time and uh after talking to you at amiga ireland i knew we had to we had to do it sooner rather than later yeah for sure i think there's a lot of kind of crossover with this stuff with analog and audio digital stuff mm -hmm. you know great and uh thanks for talking no problem i'll see you later bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. Mm -hmm.